Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the new screensavers is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. The new screensavers is brought to you by 23andMe, an online genetic analysis company that helps you understand your 23 pairs of chromosomes, your DNA. Get over 75 genetic reports today and start exploring your DNA at 23andMe.com slash twit. Gassy surprises from Jupiter, Sony's full-frame A9, and Lenovo's new 2-in-1. Live from the Twit East Side Studios in beautiful Petaluma. It's the new screensavers. Doing our show open, you notice that big movie star, big movie star. Hello, Ian Thompson. Always a pleasure, there. Always Welcome a pleasure. Welcome to the new Screensavers episode 106. They said we'd be sued out of existence by episode 100. Didn't happen. <laughs> Didn't happen. We're still here. We're still humming on Saturday, May 27th, 2017. Ian Thompson from the Register. It's great to see you. Always good fun. You wore an appropriate shirt. Well, yeah, you know, it's, it's sort of I'm. I'm, I'm we have a, a sort of synchronicity. With we're working shirts. on it now. We're working on it. Yeah, we're all the tropical guys. We got a big show for you. We're going to look at the Juno cam, the Juno spacecraft, sending back amazing pictures. You can even work on them if you want. We got yep. a scientist to talk about the surprises they found. We, we've been talking about this all along, including new magnetic storms, uh, magnetic fields, and some storms. There's a camera that I have ordered twice <laughs> and canceled twice. It uh, came out a couple of days ago, the new Sony mirrorless A9. Is it worth the $4,000 plus dollars just for the body alone? You do realize you've got a cookie on your machine now. It's like, in, we know he's interested in this. So let's oh, juggle it around I bet, the price. right? I'll start getting like uh, coupon offers. Yeah. And Carrie from DP Reviews on the line. I am, I am going in a week, a little more than a week, I'm going to uh, South America, Machu Picchu and the Galapagos, and I need to bring a good camera and I'm torn, so maybe Carrie can help me. Maybe Carrie can help me. We also, I did get a new laptop for the trip. This is the Lenovo 2-in-1, the Yoga, uh, the second generation, just came out. It's been, it was, they talked about it at CES, finally started shipping. I'll give you a little mini review of that. I've had it for a few days. I love what Father Robert's been up to on Know How. Last week, they infected their network with WannaCry. Intentionally. An experiment which could so easily go wrong. <laughs> yeah, they didn't tell me before they did it, only after it was successfully contained. <laughs> Turns out there's a guy who's figured out using another bug in Windows, mm -hmm. a bug in the way that Windows generates its crypto keys, how, if you haven't rebooted the system, you can defeat WannaCry. It's called WannaKiwi. Mm -hmm. Let's see if it works. Father Robert's going to do the experiment. Yikes. <laughs> He's going to infect another system. Uh, we have a new toy from Sphero. Remember the BB-8? Yeah. Sphero is really doing some interesting technology. They have, in honor of Cars 3, which is coming out soon, they've taken the star of Cars, Lightning McQueen, right. and they've made the best remote control car you have ever seen. Is this a question of the, of the car being better than the movie? Because based on Cars 2, that's it's a possibility. It's going to be better than the movie. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, I think it is. Nathan Oliver as Giles has a review. We're going to answer some of your questions. We've got uh, lots of There it is. Nope, oh, 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 don't, don't, oh, don't. Oh, oh. Let's surprise everybody. Where do you meet Lightning McQueen? First, though, the topics, the big topics of the week. There's mm -hmm. some, some big news. Uh, it happened today. It's over. Game three, AlphaGo, uh, Google's Master AlphaGo is Google's Master Go computer That's beats the world champion, Kujia. It's a picture of utter dejection. That's could there. yeah, it's not AlphaGo. Uh, yeah, he got beat three times in a row. Mm -hmm. It was the best of three series. V uh, you know, just stunning. And you see, even there, that the, the time advantage. AlphaGo still has a minute, 50, an hour fifty-three left out of the three hours. Could yeah, is down to his last half hour. This is the last few moves of the game. A four-hour game. Brutal. Absolutely brutal. Well, and it's interesting because uh, I remember very well when. 
I was a I was a serious chess player, tournament chess player. Oh, when big blue, when big beat, deep blue beat, beat Kasparov. Blue. Yeah, and Although it was very was dejecting chess. to the chess community. It was mm. like, oh, you know, they almost wanted to give up the game. They've kind of adjusted since. In fact, now almost all the top players train with computers. Right. Because computers are, frankly, better at chess. But everybody thought Go will be a lot harder. It's not as calculable. There's too many variations. Mm -hmm. So computers have to do pattern recognition. They have to kind of almost understand what's going on. And what's interesting how the Go community has reacted to this, they feel like, in some ways, AlphaGo has, is doing something artistic and beautiful and making moves no human would this have made. They, they, did, they actually traced it back. Yeah, nobody, no human has ever done that, and it was a winning move. And it's brilliant. And these things that, you know, it, this is how the game is going to get revolutionized. I mean, I remember when Deep Blue beat Kasparov when it was started. Well, it was speed chess, so it's not exactly the... And then they came back and wiped the floor no. again with humans, and this is going to happen with every game. You can, with chess, as hard as it is, as many variations as there are, you can, with some certainty, calculate enough moves ahead mm -hmm. to figure out what the best move is in every case. And that's the interesting thing. Chess computers don't play a beautiful game. No. They play a brute force game mm -hmm. where they just grind you down. AlphaGo is kind of different. In fact, the first game against Kujia, it won by the smallest possible margin, oh, half point. point. Five, yeah. And, and, and the reason is the computer is not trained, as humans are, to want to crush the opponent. Just, we want to win. Yeah. We want to beat the guy. The computer says half a point is as good as 100 points, doesn't matter, as long as I win. And so this is something very different in the Go world, and I think it's fascinating to watch. If they ever make a play for Go for poker, though, I'm going to be watching these guys like a whore. Well, they are doing it. Well, yeah, but and I mean... And it, beat, it beats some an, very good poker players. And if I was an AI researcher, I would develop, you know, oh, no, we're developing this this poker AI, it's all academic, and then we'll be going online <laughs> at night <laughs> and you know they are. Up. You know, you know they're doing that. You know they're doing but that. But now if you play online poker, you know, the people you're playing against have all these software aids which are being used and it's I know. It's got to the point now where it's better playing face to face in yeah, some regards. Yeah, I think so. Um, I do I do think that it was interesting that the Chinese government and you confirmed this. I'd saw I'd seen this, I thought, oh, this isn't true. To the best of my knowledge, it's true. They blocked the broadcast of these games, these Of the first game, yeah. Because they didn't want to show a machine besting the best the player? national game of China, you know? I wow. mean, it's, it, it, there's a considerable amount of national pride brought up in this. And I think, to be honest, it was nice that, you know, they've, they've dealt with it so well. But that first game, I think it was kind of like, yeah, we're, we're just going to not, you know, stream this out directly, just yeah. find out how it's going to go. And it but, didn't go well. <laughs> no, 3 0 straight down. Yeah. I mean, you wow. saw the picture, the poor guy looked crushed. Yeah, I think but, he was also exhausted. And he hmm. an interesting thing happened in the second game. Kujia was winning. In fact, the AlphaGo guy said he has played perfectly for the first hundred moves. But then Kujia said, I got excited. I thought maybe I'm going to win and I made mm -hmm. some mistakes. And he said, this is where the computer has a huge advantage because it's not emotional. It's not emotionally involved, yeah. Doesn't care. At least I hope <coughs> not. Otherwise we've gone a little yeah, too it, far in the AI. That is another sphere. problem entirely. <laughs> Did you see Mark Zuckerberg at Harvard? He was surprisingly good. I was expecting to hate it, you know, the, the whole bunch of sort of pseudo-funny PR speak. But he I was disappointed was... that he wasn't wearing a top hat. Apparently that is de rigueur at Harvard commencement. Oh, come on, he's wearing a suit and a tie. How often have you seen that? In the yeah, but look at the guy in the top hat. What the yeah. hell is that? He looks like he's wearing a costume. He's like, a, he's like Dick Van Dyke and Mary Poppins. I know, but come on. Hello, Mark. I am honored to be here with you today because, let's face it, you accomplished something I never could. <laughs> they graduated. Yeah. If I get through this speech today, it'll be the first time I actually finish something here at Harvard. <laughs> you gotta love Last the self-deprecation. 2017, congratulations. Awesome. Yeah. And you have to think that they are very excited to see Harvard's oh, yeah. most successful graduate. And he's practically um, their age. Well, he, he's not a graduate. Bill Gates was there I'm sorry. and out at the same time. I'm sorry. If I'm going to be a pedant about this... Harvard's second am. most successful dropout. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> and bad news for Chipotle. Yes, there's another bug at mm -hmm. Chipotle, although this time it's not E. coli. It's what The Verge called E-X-E dot coli. Most of its restaurants were infected with credit card stealing malware yeah they're doing to their to your credit cards what their burritos do to your colon <laughs> <It's just laughs> that is terrible <laughs> the malware searched for 
track data, which sometimes has the cardholder name in addition to card number, expiration date, and internal the verification. The missing, but that's the whole ball game. It's <laughs> the whole thing. Read from the magnetic stripe as was, as was routed through the point of sale device. Uh, you couldn't get much worse than that. No, so, I mean it's it's a massive break, and I mean we just it's it's weird. It came on the same day, on the same week, sorry, that Target agreed to pay out the final settlements for its point of sale. It had the same right? problem, didn't it? Yeah, and they got fined. I think the states they had to pay out to the states eighteen point five million, which we worked out is the equivalent to about seven and a half hours profit for them for the last year. <laughs> but so that's Target nothing compared to what the credit card companies want. Because remember, oh, yeah. no, if you're had... defrauded on your credit card, the credit card companies pay. But then they sue. Mm. They're furious at Target, and I bet you they'll be furious at Chipotle because oh, they, they got to recover their Yeah, they, they rang uh, 110 million out of Target, <laughs> uh, wow. the credit and banking card companies. So I should oh. imagine Chipotle, they, Chipotle is having to pay out a similar amount. Yeah, not only do the credit card companies have to reimburse you, they have to send you a new card because your card's been yep. compromised. Yep. Crazy. Crazy. And there's also the possible danger to your credit rating if someone's gone completely wild with it. Right, so right. That takes a while to sort out. All right, kids, we're going to go to Jupiter in just a second. Uh, it's, oh, you know, <laughs> finally, we're not the only gas giants in the room. Uh, <laughs> oh, pictures of Jupiter can be yours, but first, let's talk about your genetic problems. What is that mug? That is the best mug ever. Uh, it's one of yours, in fact. It's I, Adventure Time. It looks like I either of that. Somebody, Disney or a Ren and Stimpy thing. Yeah. Uh, our show today brought to you by 23 and me. I love this. Have you done this yet? Actually, one of the guys in our office has, and he found out he was 3.5% Neanderthal, which is yes. no one. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually less than average on the Neanderthal scale. Oh, you've done it. Oh, yeah, I did this ages ago, and it was really easy because you just spit into a vial. You don't, there's no blood or no, not hair or anything. You just literally it's just spit. And what 23 is, of course, is your 23 pairs of chromosomes. So they can give you over 75 genetic reports. I'll log into my 23andMe, and I can show you a little bit about myself. It's really fun, and the nice thing is, I did it years ago, but they're always giving me more information. Oh, really? So, Get updates. Uh, yeah, as they are, you know, learning more and more about uh, genetics, they're actually getting more information uh, Ooh, about, for instance, my caffeine consumption report. That's that's kind of new. Hang on, well, that tells you how much you have been drinking or how much you should be drinking. It's what your tendency is. Here's the yeah. thing that you were talking about, the Neanderthal, my ancestry report. I can learn about. This is new. My maternal haplogroup, which is U5A1B1, shows the migrate. Get this. This is the oh, migration wow. of my maternal line. They started in uh, East Central Africa. I was going to say you're a European at heart. Yeah, no, this is 180,000 years ago. Then they migrated and it got to Europe about 47,000 years ago. Just as so, the crush was setting in. Just, it was a good time. Those were the it days, ends. my friends. They thought they'd never end. You could hunt mammoth until <laughs> cows went home. And I <laughs> love that. But there's also a chance that we've interbreeded with the Neanderthals because, yes, I have some Neanderthal We've genes all had drunken one-night stands we regret. Uh, man, that girl, she had no brow. It was just all, you know, it was weird. But anyway. I thought she was a Geordie. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible. I could see that my Neanderthal ancestry, I actually... I'm not super uh, Neanderthal. I have only 265 Neanderthal variants, which is puts me in the bottom third of 23 and. But it's customers. quite. I, I did a piece on a piece on this because Neanderthals gave us an, a propensity to addiction to nicotine, apparently. Ah, which was just like, isn't that interesting? Presumably, a revenge for wiping them out, but you know, it's, they like to smoke. That's uh, weird. No, it's just but they had the genes which were attracted to nicotine. I just I, this I find this stuff so interesting. Um, let, let me tell you right now, this is a great time. You can use the, let me show you, do you know my relatives? This is so cool. So because it, they can match you up, and this is something that changes all the time with other 23andMe customers. Right. This is my second cousin. And you've never heard of this person before. But I know it's true. You know why? His last name is my grandmother's maiden name. Ah, okay. They didn't know that. This she is, is cool. so, okay. so if, you know, you can, of course, keep this private. And there are people who, who, you know, you see she's anonymous. There are people who are anonymous. But if you want, and I, I put, I said, no, no. If somebody finds out they're my first cousin, I would love to talk to them. So I've been contacted by other relatives. We've had oh, conversations. Okay. It's so cool. Well, you've got a lot of them as well. Your Christmas card list must be a pain <laughs> in the backside to do. <laughs> uh, there's 50 pages of these. Oh, good I grief. mean, yes. 
And and that's one of the famous? things that's also changed over time as more and more people have done it. I want you to go to 23andme.com slash twit and start exploring today. You can learn so much. Their carrier status reports, which, by the way, meet FDA requirements. You may remember you okay. wrote about that. The FDA said, well, wait a minute. And we, they've got together and they... They have completely complied with FDA requirements. You can find out if you're a carrier for inherited conditions, a carrier for like cystic fibrosis or hereditary hearing loss, which I am, by the way. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Fascinating. 2323andme.com slash twit. This would be, I think, something to do for yourself, but I think a great gift. Wouldn't this be a great gift for like a uh, college grad? Or for Father's Day? I was thinking about my, my, mother, my mother, to be honest, because she's always been interested in ancestry. But. Ideally, you get everybody in your family to do it. Right? Yeah. And then you can compare results, and it's just fascinating. Unless, 23 and me. Right there is a danger, though. If you get everyone in your family doing it, and somebody stands out as not being part of your family. You're not part of our family. <laughs> Bye-bye. You know, you have no genetic resemblance to us. We always thought you were a stranger. All right, let's go to, are you ready to go to uh, Jupiter? Oh, I'm looking forward to it. The Juno spacecraft is out there. It's orbiting Jupiter, and we are now getting data back. I know John gets so excited about this. We all do. We love space science. You know there's three Lego figurines on the, on the Juno probe? There's one of Jupiter, one of his wife, and one of Galileo. That's hysterical. And they have a deal with Lego where they put like, little Lego figurines on all these space probes. That's awesome. And quite what the aliens, when they find these, are going to think <laughs> is, you know. It's... They're going to think we were very primitive when we sent little icons of ourselves. <laughs> we did talk about this back on episode 60, but let's get a, uh, an update. Rob Ebert is on the line. He's a research scientist with Southwest Research Institute. Rob, great to talk to you. Hey guys, how you doing? So the principal investigator for this comes from Southwest Research Institute and you work in conjunction with NASA, right? That's correct. Okay. So where are we right now? Where is Juno? Uh, Juno is on an outbound leg of its sixth orbit, moving away from the planet, probably 20 to 30 planetary radii from Jupiter. Okay. Well, oh, that's quite far out. It's not, it's not, it's not going to come any closer or how close is it going to come? It, it comes the closest it comes, which we call it perijove, is three to four thousand kilometers from Jupiter's cloud tops. Wow! And that's when Juno is at its closest uh, period to Jupiter, and it basically does a pole-to-pole -pole pass in about two hours. Oh, but the so. orbit itself takes it well beyond uh, the planet. About about 110 Jovian radii from the planet is the furthest it, it reaches in its orbit. So it's quite an elliptical and, orbit. Why is that? That was actually initially by design. Mm -hmm. um, when they designed the mission, they wanted to have time to operate all the instrumentation prior to getting into the shorter orbits that were planned for Juno. Uh -huh. And so they designed, initially it was a 100, 120, or sorry, 106 day orbit. And then it got broken down into two 53 day orbits. But how things worked out, we were actually in 53 day orbits for the rest of the mission. I was gonna say, because there's a problem with the main engines as I understand it. Uh, let's just say that when you have a spacecraft in orbit that's taking great data, um, you don't want to put it at risk. Yes, absolutely. And Jupiter is very volatile. You've got storms yeah. at both poles, right? Correct. And, uh, so, and is there a big magnetic field as well as it gets closer? It, so J Jupiter has the largest magnetic field in the solar system, and we've uh, measured it. Uh, as, closer to, as close to the planet as any spacecraft has ever done. Uh, and the, the magnetic field strength at closest approach was about 10 times that of the surface field strength here at Earth. So that could, could complicate the mission significantly as well. There definitely has to be um, design uh, implementations to, to deal with that. Yeah. Got it. And I gather the magnetic field is, is quite different than we thought it would be. I mean, it, it seems to be fairly uneven in places, and you have a very odd effect with your auroras there that the, the spacecraft actually got some good images of. Absolutely. So there's a, there's a number of things actually to talk about regards to that statement. The first is that, so the magnetic field was much stronger than we, than we predicted. Hmm. Um, and the predictions were based on models that were developed um, using magnetic field observations from previous missions to Jupiter. But the difference is that the spacecraft that uh, explored the planet previously didn't get as close. And so there's some components of the magnetic field that basically decrease very rapidly with distance from, from the source, from the planet. And so you, you need to get very close to the planet to measure those. And with Juno, we were able to do that. 
Um, also, there was a lot of spatial variability in the magnetic field that was unexpected. Um, and that's leading some interpretation that maybe the dynamo that produces the field is actually closer to, uh, say, the, 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 the surface or the surface that Jupiter is really the cloud tops. It's closer to that than we previously thought. But again, this is still early days. So we have a lot of data to analyze and collect before we can come to a definitive conclusion. And no signs of a black monolith anywhere. You know? <laughs> well, that's, nice. that's right. How 2001 yeah. starts. It's on Jupiter, isn't it? It's right. We're looking, but not yet. <laughs> so what have we learned? What kind of thing? I mean, there are obviously already some surprises. What are we learning? Uh, we've learned a lot. I bet. Um, so for anywhere, so Jupiter, or sorry, Juno is, is focused on a number of main uh, themes. One is what's the origin and evolution of Jupiter, and then what is basically exploring the polar magnetosphere and aurora. And, and in terms of the origin and evolution, we're measuring Jupiter's gravitational field uh, to high precision magnetic field and look, peering through the cloud tops deep into the atmosphere. And this is something that really we haven't done on a global sense. Um, the only time that we've been able to take measurements below Jupiter's cloud tops was during the Galileo era, mm. when we actually sent uh, the spacecraft into the atmosphere as a, at the end of the mission. Crash yeah. landed, um, it, yeah. So, but what we're learning now is, so this is this image here. We've never it's explored Jupiter's wow. poles, wow. and this is the first. This is, I think, this is from Perigov one. This is the first time. Actually, no. Let me take that back. This is a compilation of several passes, but this is good. this is the first images ever of Jupiter's southern pole, and it's just you know, first of all, just looking at the imagery is striking. It almost looks like an oil painting it's or beautiful, a, yeah, a Van Gogh painting. You yeah, know that. but the but are those all these, storms? These uh, these whorls? So a number of the things that you're looking at there are, are cyclones. Cyclones. Um, wow. Yeah. So these are these are storms. The side of the planet. Yeah. These are. Um, these are storms that are rotating. This is the southern hemisphere, so they'd be counter or clockwise rotating storms around low pressure regions. Um, and they're tending to cluster around the pole. But there's a lot of other structure there too in, in, embedded within there as well. A lot of a lot of features that we're really just now starting to, to try to understand. Has so the image very, been uh, colorized, or is that the actual color? No, I think there's some synthetic okay. colorization. Yeah. I am um, not a I'm not a imaging processing person, but I don't think these are true color. Yeah. Well, good news. If you are an image processing person, you can actually, I understand, yes. get access to the raw photos from the camera. Absolutely. So uh, all of these images are on uh, a website, www.mission.edu. Oh, you've already got it up, missionjuno.swri.edu. Um, from there, so basically the visible camera called JunoCam is not only a, a scientific tool, but it's also being used as a, in a public outreach effort to try to engage uh, the public in, in this mission. And there's several ways you can do that. One. Um, if you're if you're taking images of Jupiter yourself, you can upload those onto the website, and they're actually using those to create mosaics of Jupiter um, prior to each pole to pole pass. Uh, the second way you can do that is you can actually vote on where you want the Juno image to focus during these polar passes. So you can basically help JunoCam select what regions of Jupiter's atmosphere they're going to measure, and then finally you can get the raw images and do image processing yourself. Nice. And a lot of the images that have been released have had actually processing done by um, what we're calling, you know, citizen scientists or amateur astronomers and are getting credit and doing great work. So that's interesting. This is more than a publicity stunt. These, there are actually a lot of amateur astronomers out there who have the skills and the abilities to add to the work you're doing? Correct. Wow. Yeah. yeah, and when they find the stuff, it's... Look at these know, images. It's these, just amazing. It is like art. I mean, it is... Good. Yeah, it's it's incredible. That could be H.R. Um, Geiger. Uh, yeah, I mean, and when that's you think incredible. that the you know the entire funding for NASA to make this happen is about half a cent, is, is about a, a cent, a couple of cents per person in in the U.S. I mean, it's just it's well worth it. Oh, and, well it's, worth it. and we're learning so much from this. Really. So, do you have you have another fifty? How many more orbits do you have? Another fifty-three day orbits uh, cycle? Oh, we, or? so we're on orbit six, orbit number six. We are going to go to orbit thirty-three. Okay. So we're going to be orbiting Jupiter for the next. Four years. Lots more yeah. images to come. I was going to say, is this is it something that could be extended, or is the probe expanded, expected to sort of start to degrade after that time? 
Well, so one of the issues with, with flying a spacecraft in Jupiter's environment is that it has the most intense radiation belts in the solar system. And so fly, and with the orbit that we have, we're, we are flying through that region. Now, the orbit's designed to kind of to try to minimize that, but as we progress through the mission, it gets worse and worse. And so uh, there's a possibility that uh, our instrumentation starts to degrade due to radiation uh, damage. But, you know, another way of mitigating that is a lot of the electronics are housed in, in a vault, right. basically a, a shield for, for the electronics. So, you know, the, so far so good. Everything looks to be operating well. And um, there's no real sign of, of, of de degradation. But the original mission was planned to be, you know, one and a half to two years. Now we're talking about five years in that system. So it's, it's difficult to say um, what the spacecraft will be like at that time. Then again, when it comes to building things to last, NASA is possibly the masters of this. The Opportunity Probe is still trundling across the Martian surface 11 years later, yeah. and it was only predicted to last for three months. Juno's so. almost six years old. It did a really interesting kind of slingshot around the Earth to get yeah. to Jupiter. I thought that was really a, a yeah. cool maneuver. And tell me about so, Jade. This is a, an auroral, auroral experiment you're doing. Why are correct. the auroras so interesting? Uh, well, many different different reasons. One, uh, so the aurora produced at Jupiter are the strongest uh, observed in our in our solar system, and uh, you know we've done a lot of work of understanding the auroral processes at, here at Earth, um, but we don't really under, understand the processes that produce them elsewhere. You know, the, the, the sort of the picture is the same, but the details we're not sure if they're different or not. Um, you know, one, one difference, say, between Earth and Jupiter is that at Earth, the processes that lead to the production of the aurora are externally driven. What that means is that there are structures that are basically released from the sun, and if they, they can interact with the Earth's magnetosphere, which is sort of the magnetic bubble around the Earth, and the process of, uh, basically the process that interaction leads to produces the aurora. At Jupiter, the aurora is produced by processes internal to the system. And so we want to understand how those processes work. And by understanding how that process works at Jupiter, we can understand how that process works at other planets, um, both in our solar system and the number of exoplanets that we're observing in, around other planetary systems. So it's just a way of us trying to better understand uh, the physics of, of one aspect of these environments and then trying to put that into context of what we already understand. Just remember, though, you're not allowed to, to land on a, on a Europa, right? That planet, <laughs> keep away. I've heard that they've keep away from, attempt no landing on Europa. I'm yes. just saying. All the other planets <laughs> in the solar system are yours. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Hey, we, uh, we don't have any plans for that. <laughs> <laughs> it's real. Oh, this is not science fiction. This is science fact. And it is truly Indeed. awesome. So what happens at the end of Juno's mission? Well, if we if we do the deorbit uh, plan, we'll basically just deorbit into the atmosphere, uh, similar, I guess, to Galileo. I'm, I'm assuming the instruments will be on, and we'll collect data mm. until mm. until we no longer have communication. Fantastic! Well, Look at that! Yeah. Wow! Amazing. Well, everybody must go to the site, look at the pictures, and it, yeah, if you're an amateur astronomer, take the raw images, see what you can do. There's some really good work already been done. I see a color image of the one of the moons. It's really spectacular from an amateur. Rob, thank you so much for joining us. Rob Ebert is a research scientist with Southwest Research Institute. They're in charge of Juno, working with NASA to help us learn more about one of the biggest, well, the biggest planet yep. in, our, uh, in our solar system. Thank you, Rob. Thanks, guys. Great to talk to you. That was fantastic. You Isn't that neat? Yeah. Those images are stunning. And we've got another spacecraft going around Saturn at the moment, uh, doing the same sort of I thing. Loved, I love like, what NASA's up to. And it costs us virtually nothing, and we're learning so much from yeah, this. Yeah. It's, this is what we're supposed to do as humans, get out there, explore. I think so. Find out what's there. Yeah, I think so. Hey, we're going to take a look in just a second with about uh, with the Sony's new A9 camera. I'm really, I'm, I am on the fence. I know, you've been on tenterhooks. I, am, I have A7s like. up the wazoo. Should I get an A9? I don't know. We're going to talk to DP Review. They've had some time. And Father Robert has a very interesting... Should we, let's do that now. Why don't we do Father Robert now? Mm. He, so he's crazy. I know. I would. <laughs> he's crazy. So on Pl Know How last week, Robert and, and, and Brian, you were there too, right? They took a computer. I was isolated, I hope. They had their own little mini network, and they infected it with WannaCry. 
the ransomware virus yeah. that has infected over 300,000 computers all around the world cost untold amount of money in productivity lost. I mean, this is a really nasty ransomware. Yeah. Well, he's going to go one more step farther because I read another researcher has discovered a possible cure for WannaCry. Can Father Robert successfully <laughs> apply the cure? It's a miracle. It's a miracle. Let's watch. The past two weeks have seen the world go crazy from the news about WannaCry, a ransomware package that combines a crypt locker with a Samba worm and a backdoor, the latter of two which were leaked from an NSA exploit toolkit. Now, there's been a lot of FUD, a lot of sensationalism about what it can and cannot do, but we at Twit thought that we could break it down and show you exactly what WannaCry does to your operating system and perhaps give you the information you need to protect yourself. To show how WannaCry works, we've set up a clean but unpatched installation of Windows 7. We have a sample set of pictures and documents on the desktop and antivirus software installed. I have a sample of the original WannaCry ransomware and upon execution, as if you had clicked on an email attachment or suffered from a scripting attack that allowed for a remote execution of code, it immediately searches for common data file extensions and encrypts them. The encryption process is of note because it works a lot like PGP in having a public and private key. The private key is created by taking two random prime numbers and using them to generate a unique sequence that supposedly is only obtainable by paying the ransom. As the ransomware finishes its search, it deletes all the original file names, leaving nothing but encrypted copies with the extension WNCry. However, it should be noted that even before the original files are deleted, WannaCry has made those files unreadable. The machine will also start spamming the network with LLMNR, or Local Link Multicast Name Resolution Calls, searching for other vulnerable clients on the network. Once it's done, the desktop background is changed to WannaCry Red and Black, and the WannaCry Decrypt screen pops up, telling you how much time you have to pay before the ransom goes up, and again before your files are permanently encrypted. There's a good chance that you've already seen that process on the news or on YouTube, but we didn't stop there. We ran the infection more than three dozen times testing different scenarios. Some of the takeaways? If you connect any clean storage to a WannaCry infected machine, either in the form of removable storage or on a network share, WannaCry will immediately start encrypting those files. Attempting to undelete the original unencrypted files will only give you files with the proper file names filled with gibberish. Blocking TCP port 445 on your network will prevent WannaCry from spreading laterally on your network, though that will also disable one of the most popular data transfer protocols available. And WannaCry doesn't check or encrypt any files that look to be system files. So if you just happen to rename your favorite data files with .dll, .com, or .exe extensions, they'd be safe once copied off the infected computer. Though if you restore their original extensions on the infected computer, they'd immediately be encrypted. But the big news this past week was the creation of a fix for WannaCry encrypted machines. Adrian Guinet developed WannaKey to recover the private key from XP machines, and Benjamin Delpy turned WannaKey into WannaKiwi, which works on XP Vista 7.8 and 8.1. Using WannaKiwi is simple. Bring up the task manager to get the process ID of WannaCry. Then drop into an administrative command shell and run WannaKiwi. If it doesn't work the first time, use that PID that you got from the task manager to tell WannaKiwi exactly where WannaCry lives. Their solution is ingenious. Though the private key was deleted, the memory space that was allocated for WannaCry could still contain the two prime numbers that were used to generate the private key. WannaKey and WannaKiwi first find the public key, then search for those primes and recreate the private key. One problem. You have to be lucky. Really, really lucky. Those primes aren't deleted by the WannaCry process, but they're not protected either. It's possible that WannaCry could overwrite the memory that contains the primes, and rebooting or killing the process or otherwise disturbing the memory could lose the primes forever. I ran 18 WannaCry WannaKiwi cycles, and I was only able to recover the sample data three times. Unfortunately, it is a brilliant solution. It's inspired, but it requires a lot of luck, and it requires a lot of really good timing, and that's not something you can count on. Of course, download WannaKiwi. Make sure it's in your inventory. In fact, make sure it's on your computer ready to go just in case. But that should not be your strategy to protect yourself. Instead, we turn to the old standard. Make sure your computers are patched. Make sure your network is secure. Make sure that you don't have any ports open that aren't being used 
And yes, you need to look at your personal security. Don't be opening attachments. In fact, don't be accepting emails from people you don't know. And most definitely turn off those scripting options that might expose your computer to remote code execution. A WannaCry is only the tip of the iceberg. We're going to see far more persistent and advanced threats into the future. Now, if you want to see our full WannaCry WannaKiwi teardown, you need to watch Know How, episodes 312 and 314 at twit.tv slash kh. I'm Father Robert Ballester, the digital Jesuit for Twit TV. He infected 36 computers with WannaCry? Yeah. You guys are nuts! So, again, the takeaway on this, Wana Kiwi does not work in many situations. No. If you've rebooted, forget about it. It takes advantage, in my opinion, I don't think I'm wrong on this, of a flaw in the Windows encryption tool, which is what WannaCry uses. Mm -hmm. It leaves the two prime numbers in memory, and as long as they stay in memory and don't get overwritten, Wana Kiwi can find them and unencrypt. But as you saw, it only worked in a small percentage of the total cases. Yeah, and it's very much a sticking plaster. And the, the, the only way well, to really deal with this is to make sure you're constantly patched. Don't today. get it in the first place. And, and, and you're going to see, and this is going to go on because there's a lot of people who want to take advantage of other people's pain. Mm -hmm. But there's a brisk market in supposedly ransomware decryptors. Uh, yeah. Very few of them work. If they do if work, any, it's because yeah. the ransomware was poorly crafted in the first place. Mm. And as you can see, even in this case, they only work, what did he say, three times out of something like 36. It wasn't, yeah. it isn't very likely. So don't, don't I, I see mean, people no stockpiling Bitcoin. I see people preparing for getting ransomware. Don't get it in the first place. Although in this case, WannaCry wasn't spread by the traditional method, which was sending attachments to people. Oh, I thought it was. No, what they did was just, they searched out for open ports online oh. and just injected it straight in. Nice. So, well, you shouldn't have open ports either. Well, no, it's certainly not 445. You should yeah. dare never have that yeah. open to the internet. Is that, is that a, a remote access port? What is 445? Yeah, they, they can actually get in through that. Is that RPC? So, yeah. yeah, so don't do that. So, yeah, yeah not a good idea. Bad but. Idea. You know, it's one of those things. I thought it was interesting also that uh, researchers said only about 2% of the infections were XP. We thought XP would really be vulnerable. Yeah. Mostly were Windows 7. Well, yeah, XP was actually too dumb to actually to pass this on. <laughs> ah, because nice. it spread through. You had Sometimes the ransomware. dumb is good. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you had the ransomware, and then you had the network tools, which then spammed it out to everyone else on the network. XP, this didn't work because those weren't developed at the time when XP was released. So yeah, it's mainly Windows 7 and Server 2008 machines right. which went down, and they went down in a big way. Uh, oh, several hundred thousand infections. At, at last yeah, count, in in over a hundred countries, and yeah. they managed to take down uh, Britain's National Health 16 Service. Sixteen hospitals in the UK, which got the GCHQ on oh. their back. The oh. Russian Interior Ministry, so the Russians are gunning for them as well. Good. And the NSA <laughs> would really like to have a chat. So. Yeah, but the, the NSA invented the uh, the network, uh, the SMB. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah, exploit that they're taking advantage of. I know. The worst thing is there are many more NSA exploits out there. And, and more to come as well. I expect we're going to see to more believed. of these. Yeah. Oh, we're going to be terrible. seeing much more of this. It's going to be interesting times in the security yeah. industry. All right. Enough of that. Let's talk about something happy. My next camera. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Kerry Rose is on the line with us. He's an editor at DP Review. Hi, Kerry. Hey, how's it going, guys? We've all been, I've been, I ordered the A9 twice and canceled it both times because I'd heard both good and bad things about this. Sony, of course, has really taken the mirrorless world by storm with the uh, Sony Alpha cameras, in particular the A7. I bought the A7, the A7R, the A7R uh, S, enthusiast. the A7R II. I didn't buy the A7S II, and I was thinking about the A9. I have the, I have the lenses. It's a limited number of lenses, mm -hmm. but they've got these G Master lenses now. Should somebody who is already invested in the Sony ecosystem look at the yeah. A9? Well, you know, I just think it depends on what you want to shoot. I mean, you said yourself, you, you ordered it twice and you canceled it twice, which means you're maybe having the same sort of... I'm ambivalent. Of, uh, mm. Yeah, you're having... A, it's, almost, it's almost like a camera identity crisis. Well, I mean, I, first all, of all, it's very expensive, but I also very have an expensive. A7R two, and I have heard, and I'd love to know what your experience has been, that the dynamic range on the A9 is actually lower than the A7R two. 
It is, un, uh, oh, unquestionably. Okay. At least uh, if you're shooting things like landscapes, the A7R2 is going to be a better camera for you in, in, in that way. The A9 is really geared. Actually, I should probably pull it over. Yeah, let's hey, see it. I've got yeah. it. <laughs> there yeah. it is. And one of those it great looks, G Master lenses. You got the zoom, it looks like. On actually, this uh, it's actually just a very large 35 millimeter. Oh. Uh, <laughs> 35 one four. Well, that's, one, is, that's, by the way, one of the great things about the uh, Sony cameras is, is, uh, is the adapters. You can take a lot of old lenses and put those on the the Sony body and get, adva get the advantage of the new electronics and the new sensors. You can, you can all, not only do that, you can put a lot of, um, honestly, a lot of Canon glass on yeah. here. And you get, yeah, well, yeah. well, not full autofocus, but you get uh, some pretty good autofocus You're using the, me the Metabones adapters? Uh, we do, we have Metabones adapters and then we've got Sony's own adapters for their A mount okay. lenses. And then there's that Sigma adapter too, right. uh, which right. they released for this camera as so well. So tell us about the A9, what's new, what's different? Hmm. What's new, what's different? Well, first of all, I mean, if you look at the thing, it's pretty like, if you're not holding it, it looks pretty much like an A7R2. Yeah. Uh, once you get it in your hand, it feels pretty different pretty quick. Um, you've got an extra couple of dials, extra couple of controls up here, and these are for uh, your drive mode, so whether you want to shoot 20 frames a second or 10 or 5, and then there's also your autofocus mode, so you don't have to assign a button to those. There's just dials at this point. I hear that and that's where this really sings, is in very fast focus and very fast burst modes. It is indeed. So if that's your bread and butter, this is definitely a camera a shooter. A sports shooter, a bird mm -hmm. shooter, yeah, something like that. Yeah, wildlife. Absolutely, absolutely. This is really the first time that we've seen really any uh, competitor besides Nikon and Canon go after this market of really pro-action, pro-fast uh, moving subject uh, photography. Yeah. With this sort of like kind of vigor. I mean, like this camera's just got so much packed into it. It's incredible. They okay. also have talked about this new sensor that it's it's stacked. What is what is what is it about this sensor? So what that means is that they've actually put so much more of the electronics so close together. So there's actually RAM chips built onto the back of the sensor. Wow. This okay. is a good test, by the way. I remember this from the Sony press uh, presentation. Yeah, they did sports. Uh, <laughs> they did sports of uh, all kinds mm -hmm. that you, so you could shoot some action stuff. They yeah. did, yeah. That was one of our uh, one of our uh, tests right there. Yeah. Uh, but what that means is there's actually yeah there are ram chips. Wow. Right so on this the back is burst the mode. This is not a movie. That's a mm -hmm. movie. No. That, no. 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 That's a burst mode. That's 20 <laughs> frames a second. Wow. Oh, good grief. <laughs> wow. Okay. So I can see the value of that. It's pretty cool. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. Because because the, the the previously the fastest you would get with a camera that could focus this well and shoot that fast. You're shooting 12 frames a second, or you're shooting 14 frames a second. So now you're getting 20. Wow. You're getting that much more, uh, that many more frames per second. So that's because they stacked the electronics. That's so what they can get that kind of speed out of it. That's a big part of it. I mean, they're basically so you can shoot 20 frames a second, and then it's actually taking autofocus and auto exposure measurements 60 times every second. <gasps> so for like wow. you shoot every. You know, photo you're getting, you're getting three measurements of autofocus and auto exposure. It's pretty so th cool. That's a good point. As that guy is running towards you in the pole vault, you have to Constantly refocus. Having... He's moving towards you, so that that's all tracking focus there. Yes, and what we uh, we've been talking about with uh, Canon and Nikon's is they actually have some predictive algorithms because in those cameras, you know, one of the things is you have a, a mirror that comes up and the shutter goes, and the mirror comes down, and they're doing this 12 or 14 times a second. Right. It's really scientific. Uh, that's amazing. Sort of that they can do all that thing. physical movement. Mirrorless, you don't have to move anything out of the way. No, and that's, that's the big thing with this. There's no shutter. This is a, Well, there is a shutter, but it's electronic. Right. So basically what it's able to do is able to read out the sensor so fast that it can not only make those calculations, but also capture those photos. Holy cow. It doesn't even have to predict quite as much as the other cameras. It can just make those measurements so quickly that it knows almost in like real time as you do what's happening. So is that the main reason to get the A9 for the fast shooting, the fast focus? It's it's one of several reasons. I would say it's probably oh. is the main reason. Okay. The other ones I would say is it the grip is better. It's got more controls, like we talked about. The buttons feel a little chunkier. The whole camera feels a little bit beefier, but it's still um, compact. The biggest thing by far, though, is this the silent shooting. Like there's not you don't have the dynamic range of the A7R2, but you don't have to use the mechanical shutter at all. So if you're shooting a press event, like if I'm shooting the president's, God forbid, or I'm shooting <laughs> at a wedding, or I'm shooting at a you know a church mass, I can fire away completely silently. No one will know I've touched the shutter, and I'm not intruding. I'm not distracting. It's really pretty pretty cool. <laughs> I do love that feature on the A7R2 as well. But do I sacrifice quality when I use it on the A7 versus the A9? 
There is a difference, yeah. So the A7R2 sensor will read out you. It's not a big difference. In most cases, you're not going to notice it. On the A9, there's really no penalty for using uh -huh. that sort of electronic uh, shutter. Okay. You can just basically leave it on all the time, and you'll get about the same quality. Yeah. Yeah, because I'm going to. Uh, I'm so this is well, why my big debate. Life, I'm about so, to go yeah. on a on a great trip, a once in a lifetime trip, where I want to take a lot of photos to the to Machu Picchu and the Galapagos. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think I need speed. Not for mm. the tortoises and Galapagos. Yeah, no. they don't move that fast. <laughs> yeah. uh, Generally speaking. I think I'm looking at image quality going to be number one, although mm. silent shooting probably be good for a Although wildfire. you aren't going to need vistas for, for, yeah. for, for, for Machu Picchu. But now, A9 is what? How many megapixels? It's very high. It's 24. It's 24. It's only 24. I thought it was more. Oh, it's only 24. Only 24. <laughs> well, okay, so the other camera I could bring is a, is a, a Canon 5D Mark IV. Mm -hmm. Great image quality. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and uh, not silent shooting, but I've got a whole bunch of those lenses. I mean, I've invested in that. It was really, I, I invested heavily in Canon for years yeah. until the Sonys came along, and I liked the lightweight mirrorless. But one thing I did discover with the Sonys is that weight advantage is lost pretty quickly when you get the lenses, which are the uh, when you've same got size as mm -hmm. the Canon lenses. It does, and that, that is something that they've, that they've kind of downplayed kind of come to grips with as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You say, you will save, you'll save a bit of that weight on the body, but right. yeah, the really high-end lenses are, are kind of... They're big. They are kind they're of big heavy. and heavy. Yeah. yeah. But they, yeah. They, there are options. If you don't need the highest end lenses, they make like a 28 F2 that's, you know, about a third of the size. of it. Like it only comes out yeah. this far. Yeah, the pancake lenses so. are great. And that's really, yeah. a mirrorless works very well with those. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm actually moving towards the Canon and just going to bite the bullet and carry all that weight with me because I do want the best possible image quality. And I have a feeling that... Uh, what do you think, A7R2, A9, or the Canon 5D Mark IV? You know what I would say, so if it was me and I had all those cameras at my disposal and I was gonna take this trip uh, that you just described, I would probably take the A7R2 if it was me. Oh. Because then you've got to, you're at least gonna save a little bit of space on your, yep. on your body. Silent shooting. You're gonna have, a, yep. you have the silent shooting if you need it. Yep. You have a little bit more resolution if you need it, a little more dynamic range if you need it, and you can adapt all those Canon lenses uh, pretty easily to That's that body, point. and you save at least a little bit of weight from the, and from the 5D. the good news is I have like 23 Sony batteries, because <laughs> <laughs> the battery life on this is the worst I've ever used on any camera ever. And that's one thing that they finally, they fixed ah. <laughs> the A9. It doesn't look all that much bigger. This is more than twice the capacity of the A7R2 battery. It makes a oh, huge difference. You can shoot 3,000 photos on this battery if you're shooting fast action. That was one of the things I think Sony did to reduce the size and weight is they reduced the size and weight of the battery. Yeah, which is kind of, yeah. it's not a smart move, you know. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I literally, I have a bunch of them. Mm. I have a special <laughs> carrying case just for the battery. Oh, they're yeah. going to love you on aircraft now with the new lithium ion <laughs> bands. So, yes. Don't check those in your baggage. No, yeah. no I have to carry them with me. Yeah. Oh, wow. So the A9 is 40, I, I think it was $4,500 when I looked. Mm. That's correct. Minus yes. lenses. Minus lenses. Yeah. You just um, saved yourself a fortune by this segment. I'm, <laughs> I haven't bought it, and I'm not, I don't think I am going to buy it, because I have to say, most, I am not a sports shooter. I'm not a wildlife photographer. I'm not shooting birds in flight. So I don't need all that speed, and I think I'm getting a better image with the A7R2, frankly. Yeah. That's a perfectly valid. I mean, that's yeah. kind of the, the thought process I was going through as well, is this camera, it is in so many ways a better A7R2 to use, to focus. It's faster. It's more responsive. For outright image quality, there's a reason they're still making the A7R2. Yeah. Yeah. It is going to be the best outright image quality if you don't need the absolute ridiculous speed that this thing offers. And it's crazy. It's an amazing camera. Uh, not everyone needs that speed. And then if you I mean if you do, then then it's really something you're going to look at it's, carefully. It's almost a specialty camera, really. Kind of, it's coming across that way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, because you talked about what is it? Is, you know, is this going to be worth forty five hundred dollars? This is going head to head wow. with a Canon One DX two. One DX, and, exactly. Yeah. And yeah. a Nikon D five, and those right. are both six thousand and sixty five hundred dollars right. respectively. Mm. Right. And this shoots are it shoots faster frame rates. The autofocus, from what we can tell, is honestly like it's if not as good maybe marginally better in wow. some cases. Wow. So this is, it is a specialty camera. It's an amazing camera, but it's definitely not for everybody. Uh, one last question. In the mirrorless versus the DSLR with mirrors, is there, is that war making, going in any one direction? Is mirrorless the future? 
I am, whatever I say, I'm just going to get roasted in my own comments. <laughs> this uh, is really a war. I mean, it's not, I'm not using war lightly. Is. This is a battle between proponents well, and two, uh, friends like Trey Ratcliffe. He loves mirrorless. He's gone all mirrorless, but he's a, he's a landscape photographer. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, I, I don't think, yeah, I don't think you're, you're overstating it at all because this is really, this is a big kind of salvo being fired by Sony at the big two right. that they basically made a big deal. Like we've taken all of the bits that are mechanical, that can wear out, that are flapping around, that can cause shutter shock and vibrations and make your image softer. We're getting rid of that. We're going to do it all electronically and we're going to do it better. And there are still things that this camera, I think, has uh, some work to do on. Um, but the, that race is not over. That battle's not over. It's honestly more neck and neck, I think, than it's ever been. But again, you're shelling out $4,000 plus dollars to get there. Well, yeah. as you could probably tell, I seem to have no limit to the amount of money I'll spend trying to make myself a better photographer. I was going to say, we, it's, it is not working. <laughs> 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 but I have all the gear anyway. Hey, it's great to talk to you, uh, mm. Carrie. You're lucky because you get to try all this stuff. What do you? What's your day? What's your daily driver uh, for photography? The daily driver, actually, just uh, I was fortunate enough I got to post uh, an article today about a wedding I shot a couple weeks ago on an old Nikon D700. So what? That's, uh, oh. that's what? an old camera. Right. Take a look. I'll take a look. I think the photos look okay. I Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. But uh, that's I'm, I'm finally getting to the point. Uh, that article is basically about how I I know it's probably time for a new camera now. Nice. My there first, uh, my first oh, nice DSLR. Shot, yes, he's, Thank a, you very he's much. a good photographer. That's yeah. the difference. <laughs> exactly. I am yeah. not a good photographer, no, so I need either. to have the best hey, cameras. Everything takes practice. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's great to talk to you, Carrie. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, you guys the too. The A9. Much. It's out now. If you got forty five hundred schmackers just to you know lay down, you can get it. Uh, I mean, we're going to have to buy a lens too. It doesn't come with a lens. I was going to say. Price. Then there's the lenses yeah. and there's carrying cases and the bat spare batteries. Spare batteries the... are cheap, thank goodness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Kerry. Appreciate it. Cheers, mate. Thank you, guys. Wow. I tell you, I uh, actually, Kerry, stick around because we got a photography question in just a second. We got a guy going uh, to Zimbabwe wants a small right. portable uh, a point and shoot, and uh, yeah. that's always uh, the, under that is a question that comes out all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, we always talk, I like to talk about high-end photography, but a lot of people, the point and shoots these days are very good. Yeah. What can you get for a budget price that's going to work? We'll talk about that in just a second. First, I wanted to show you. Yeah. I want to, and I, I want to make a confession. This. I want to make a confession. As you know, probably know, I am a Mac guy. I've been a Mac guy since no 1984. Perfect, Don't worry in about it. In fact, I used to mock Windows. I used to say, no one would want to use Windows. My rule of thumb is Windows for business. Mac for everybody else, photographers, artists, home users. But I feel a little bit abandoned by Apple. I feel like yeah. Apple's done so well with the iPhone that they've kind of lost focus on the desktops, and in particularly on the laptops. Very much so, yes. I did buy the new Touch Bar Mac. Oh, have you managed to get Doom to play on it yet? It, you know, <laughs> no, but I can do Kit the Car, the, you know, from uh, Knight Rider. Uh, the, that's pretty cool. But uh, the touch bar, otherwise completely useless, yep. completely dumb, and I always hit it by accident. And I'm finally thinking, is it time? The difference is, in the Apple world, there's only one company that yes. makes Macintoshes, Apple. So if you want an Apple laptop, there's a, f a handful. That's it. Um, On the Windows side, there are hundreds, maybe thousands of companies making Windows laptops in all kinds of form factors. You have the Surface Pro. This is the last year's model. Uh, of last Surface year's Pro Surface Pro 4, 4. Yes. The 5, or actually they don't call it the 5, no, but the no, new no, Surface Pro, the Pro just came out. I've been using the Surface Book. Mm -hmm. uh, I have, uh, as you know, the Surface Studio, the big uh, yeah. one. I love it. And it's kind of made me rethink my position on Windows. Windows 10 isn't bad. I think it's actually pretty good. Mm, I don't know. I, 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 there is a steep learning curve on there if you're coming from, there from is. Windows 7. Yeah, uh, and, and or from Macintosh. Yeah. But if you use, as I do, Lightroom, Photoshop, Adobe products, yeah. Chrome, it's exactly the same. Oh, they've developed specific Photoshops just for the yeah. things like the Surface Pro. So I thought, got the camp let's the look at there. the ecosystem of Windows PCs mm -hmm. and see if I were going to pick one, what would be the best one for me? And I looked at a lot of them. And of course, I talked to a lot of people. And there's a mm -hmm. very avid, strong community around Lenovo ThinkPads. These are the high-end Lenovo's. The ones that they bought, they bought this brand from IBM. Yep. The, it's, I, as far as I know, still designed by that same team. It's I've not been designed using 
machine China. guns for the last 15 years. They haven't changed. Machines. They make really excellent machines. What put me over the top, I had an interview with Corey Doctorow, or, uh, my good friend mm. Corey Doctorow, and he's always used Lenovo computers. One, because they, they work great with Linux. Yeah. Uh, and that's always a backstop for me. I can always put Linux <laughs> on it, right, if I can't handle Windows. But two, he really likes the service and support. He buys, and I did buy on this, mm -hmm. the next day uh, replacement. Oh, right, okay. In 160 countries, uh, accidental damage. It wasn't very expensive. It was a few hundred bucks for three years. And okay. he says, because he's a writer, I need to use this laptop. Yeah. And if it breaks, I need to get a new one the next day. It's very difficult to, to, to break a ThinkPad, though, because they are machine they're, built. They're tanks. Yeah. You can beat the mongers to death with it and you the, still have it. The other thing that was really bugging me, and one of the reasons I didn't get a Surface Pro, mm -hmm. I don't like these new short travel keyboards. I can't use Apple's keyboard accurately. I make mistakes all the time. And you know, the way I judge this is how many times it takes me to log into LastPass. It's three <laughs> or four mistyped passwords before yeah. I get in every time. And the Lenovo's are famous. Uh, for the quality of their keyboards, right? It's a pity they've they've gone back to the six rather than the seven bar keyboards. But I've my my work machine is a seven bar keyboard, but that is as good as keyboard as you'll find. I think industry. it's great. They've also improved the trackpad. They were not the best trackpads, but and they've, they've kept the magic nipple. They've kept the important. magic nipple, which I've turned off immediately because oh. I find no use for that. But if you like it, it's important. And they've also kept physical mouse yes. buttons, including the center button, which actually is, is kind of cool. I mean, I usually use the double-click, you know, tap mm -hmm. method, but it's kind of cool. This is a fingerprint reader. It works with Windows Hello. It's the fastest way to log in, and I like having a fingerprint reader. I think that's a little bit more secure than just the Hello picture Definitely. thing. I spent a little money. This is the, let me give you the information. This is the Lenovo Yoga. It's an X1 Yoga. And this is the second generation, which just came out this week. It's brand new. They promised it at CES it came out. I did splurge a little bit. That's an OLED screen, 14-inch OLED screen. That is nice. It's very high resolution, and I love OLEDs. You've, you've probably used them on uh, phones, some of you. The blacks are pitch black. The colors are rich and vivid. And I think this is a really great, gorgeous screen. I also really think, and this is another place Apple feels, I, f I feel like have let, let us down, Touch is perfectly sensible yes. on a, a laptop. Mm -hmm. You don't do it all the time, but it's just another input method along with mouse, along with nipple. Uh, having touch is very convenient sometimes. I will use touch to scroll up or down. Yep. I'll use touch to, t if it's a button, I just go hit the button. It's just it's a natural way to do it. It's email I've found as well, because if you've got your email inbox open, rather than click, Click. No, you, you can just scroll go tick, and tick, tap, tick, tap, tick, tap, tick, 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 all the way down. I the like the choice, and I think Apple has kind of let us down by not putting, I think they want to protect their iOS yes, exactly. franchise, and they've not put it on their computers, and they say they never will. But this, I would not buy a laptop now without a touch screen. This also supports a pen. It has a built-in pen. It charges when it's plugged in. It's a little smaller than the pen that comes with the Surface devices, but it does have two buttons on the top, and it can do very much the same things, including erase uh, if you turn it upside down. Uh, I find the pen very good. This is Windows 10. It's designed for pen input, yeah. and uh, it works quite well. This is a two-in-one. That means it's a convertible. The, the name Yoga is appropriate because it can do the downward dog. So let me show you the various positions. This is the traditional laptop position, but this hinge goes all the way around, so you can turn it into a tablet and, and use it just like a tablet uh, PC. And, of course, Windows 10 is very well suited for this kind of thing. And then finally... I oh, really yes. like this. Lenovo is, to my knowledge, the only company that does this. They take this nice high travel keyboard, very nice. I very rarely make mistakes on it. And watch what happens as I go into the downward dog. They call this the wave keyboard because the keys retract into the body. That is a really nice feature. And that means that not only they're non-functional, but they actually don't touch the table if you put it down on a table. And they don't snag if you're using it on a, in bed. Exactly. Or it down. slides. Yeah. So I really think that's a nice uh, touch as well. Uh, so you prefer that to a detachable screen? Yeah, I had the Surface Book, and I and I just didn't find. The, for one thing, a couple of uh, these these are awfully big to use as a tablet. I, I don't right. know how you feel about the Surface Pro, but this is even bigger. Surface Pro at least is three by two, which that is helps, a little more yeah. sensible. This is sixteen nine, which is great for watching Netflix, mm. but maybe not so great 
uh, for a tablet. In fact, watch if you use it to read magazines or read newspapers. Look how tall that is. That's yeah. just ridiculous. You're not going to read that in bed. You're going to feel like you're looking at a menu at a fancy restaurant. On the other <laughs> hand, uh, and one of the reasons I did get this is I think for travel, the ability to have a have have a um, a movie uh, running at uh, at full screen. Let me just. This is the new Brad Pitt uh, movie, War Machine, that's uh, exclusive on Netflix. On that OLED screen at 16 by 9, that is a great experience. I really feel like that's going to be a very nice way uh, on the airplane to watch movies and things like that. So, uh, keyboard is great. I, I have to say, you know, I probably won't want to put Linux on this because things like the Hello fingerprint reader, mm. the pen, the touch, all work better with an yeah. operating system designed to use it. Now... This can be pricey, as can be the Surface. I mean, it's not like uh, Microsoft's running at the low end. As configured with an i5, I didn't get an i7 processor. Right. I did get 16 megs of RAM, which I, I really wanted to have a lot of memory. I find that it really works better with a lot of memory in it. Uh, i5, oh, and a terabyte SSD. Sweet. By the way, it's an it's a, a M.2 very high speed okay. uh, SSD. Because I want to put pictures on here, I put Lightroom on, and I put Photoshop, I put all my Topaz and Nick plugins. So this is going to be a photo editing machine, uh, twenty five hundred bucks. So it's That's not cheap. No, but they could be a lot cheap, worse. Not cheap, but I think uh, a fair price for a very high end uh, system. And uh, it's light too. It's just about three pounds, a little under three pounds. It's not as light as that is. It's not as light as a Surface laptop. It's certainly not as light as a MacBook, but it's about the same as a MacBook Pro. Yeah. So roughly the same price as a high-end MacBook Pro. No touch bar, but I think, I have to say, the variety of the Windows ecosystem, to me, is something that Mac users might want to start taking a look I at. I think it's going to hurt this, this, Apple really neglecting its laptop business is really going to hurt the company in the long term because tablets are all well and good for consuming stuff, but if you actually want to create stuff, you want a serious keyboard, you want full full pen input. You know, it's I think Apple are missing a trick on this and there are some good laptop windows laptop laptops out there, including Microsoft's. I I won't, I won't deny it. We got a Microsoft well, laptop on it on the way. Yeah. And we'll we'll take a look at that. The Surface Books, I mean, it hasn't given you any problems. No, it did at first. It took about 8 months before yeah. they figured out how to get Skylake to work right. Yeah, right. that was This is by the way a KB Lake. This is a 7th generation Intel processor. I feel very good. I have to say it's been a long time since I've been excited about a laptop and one of the things I know it seems like a little thing that really makes me happy is this keyboard finally for the first time in years I have a laptop keyboard I can really bang on. I really can type that. That's the big on. weakness of the Pro is the keyboard is nowhere near as good as that one. Yeah. I, 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 uh, while I like the the lightweight and the and the pro oh mm. battery life you're going to get battery battery life on the on the surface this I don't understand how they test it they claim 15 hours mm. on this Lenovo Yoga it's about four hours 15 now, hours if you play Minesweeper and nothing else and have the yeah, Wi-Fi the maybe that's it. Down. I have to point out one other thing. Apple really has ripped us off in terms of connectors. On the high-end MacBook Pro, you've got four Type-C connectors, that's all. Yeah. Look at this. It's got a USB connector, another USB connector, both Type-3, two Type-Cs, including Thunderbolt 3. The power is Type-C, and it's non-proprietary. In fact, I don't know if you noticed, but I was using an Apple charger mm -hmm. to charge this. You do need enough wattage. 60 watts is what it comes with. Yeah, uh, you don't want to do a 10-watt charger. <laughs> It'll take forever. Also, on the back, and I don't really understand this, uh, the OLED screen can't use a SIM, but they do offer a WAN option on the, okay. on the LCD screens. And I was all excited. I saw SD card reader, but it's a micro SD card reader. That's as good as? For what? I don't use micro SD in my cameras. I don't know what that's for. What do I need a micro SD card reader? So I'm probably never going to open this port in the back. On the other side, full-size HDMI, mm -hmm. another USB 3 port. So one, two, three USB wow. ports as well as a uh, Type-C USB slash Thunderbolt slash video port and charger port. And then a little bit of a weird thing, this is a micro RJ45 Ethernet, but at least oh, it has yes. hardware Ethernet. Okay. Hardware Ethernet. And of course, the full-size HDMI is very convenient too. Yeah. In a very lightweight package. I have to say, I'm very impressed. Even with the fans running at full bore, it's just a whisper s it's okay. not. It's not a loud computer. It's very quiet. Oh, and it's got the hole in the bottom. So presumably, if you I noticed the hole in the bottom, so presumably, if you spill a glass of water over the keyboard, that's the drain point, and it's actually semi-waterproof. Are you kidding me? Uh, that's what that yeah, hole is. Yeah, that's what that hole is. <laughs> See so, that? That's where the water will come out. 
Of course, okay. chances are you're going to fry your laptop when you try it. But <laughs> this is what they tell me happens, is that if you I pour a not, glass of water over it, then the that. water will run out. So I have to say, I'm sorry, Apple, but this is the laptop I'm going to be taking with me and carrying around most of the time from now on. And I have to say, this is an example of all of this hardware innovation, the connectors, the yeah. two-in-one, the touchscreen, the pen. Apple should be doing stuff in this regard, and they're not. And I think they're just missing a bet. I'm oh, not no. crazy about using Windows. I'd rather use Mac OS on this. But you know what? Windows isn't that bad. I'm going to be happy with it. I've been using it for the last two days pretty much nonstop. And I... I can't wipe the smile off my face. You do have to spend, a, with any new Windows machine, though, you do have to spend an hour going through and locking down the privacy settings. Not me. I just let it. I said, whatever you want, uh, Microsoft, you can have it all. What are you uh, worried about? Well, we write really nasty things about Microsoft, you know? <laughs> so it's just the temptation is always going to be there. You well, know? you know, it's very much. Apple does the same thing. Apple, though, says, mm. just like Microsoft does now with the, the creator's update, it says, Look, we, we want to collect diagnostic information. You mind sending it back? I always say yes to Apple. I said yes to Microsoft. I don't. Mm. Cortana needs to have some information about location. They're going to send that back to the home office because that's where Cortana's. But why speech office needs my browsing happens. history? I still no one has satisfactorily explained well, you that could, to you me. You can turn that off. Yes, true. Uh, although there's some question about whether everything can be turned off. Apparently, some data still goes back to the home office. Yeah. I don't. I'm not. I honestly am not that worried about that. Mm. Uh, no, I mean, but you're right. For some people, that's a real cause for concern. Yeah, I'm just coming off a of Chromebook, so this is about the same level of, of, of spying on you know, the Google does. So yeah. you know, it's. I think Apple does the same. Thing. Oh yes. yes I don't I think know. Apple does any less. So uh, pros and cons, of course. The pros, all the hardware features, really add up to a very sexy, mm. usable bundle. Special attention to the keyboard, the screen. It's just fantastic. The touchpad's good. Wish bat the con, battery life. I wish it were yeah. better. And frankly, uh, it's very expensive. Mm. But I think... 20, I'm also, used to paying 2500 bucks for the computer you really are going to use hardcore. But you were saying it also, it's also got the, the central ThinkPad problem, which is they pick up fingerprint grease like nothing else. Yeah, well, I tried to sh polish it up before I showed you, but even even then, when you're doing it, and this is why I'm sure Apple refuses to, I, if I angle this just right, you can see that the fingerprint's on the screen. You're going to have to clean your screen more often. But man, that OLED screen looks Yeah, beautiful. and as the reader has pointed out, Lenovo do have a bit of a poor reputation when it comes to putting adware on there, but it's something you can But that out. was, well, first of all, there is none on here. That yeah, has that been always... On the range. low end, yeah, that wasn't when you get the higher range. end ThinkPads, they generally do not have mm. anything. And this was pretty much a signature PC. It was pretty much a pure Windows PC, except for a, a two Lenovo apps. There's no McAfee on here. Right. There's no trialware on here. There's a Lenovo settings app. Um, doesn't bother but me. none of the bloatware that you come, come I to. I found expect. no bloatware on here. Okay. I looked through uh, all of the programs and features, and there was nothing installed in here. I felt like this was a, a pretty clean yeah. laptop. So I agree. I gave them a hard time for Superfish. Um, yes. But I, that was on the low-end stuff. Yeah. That was not on the ThinkPad. So. They are also pl apparently planning to do a classic ThinkPad with, you know, with a standard, with a 7 seven Like a T-240. Oh, yeah. man, and those just, were great. And then stuff all the new kit in there. And it's everyone I've spoken to about this is... That's exciting! Take my money now. Yeah, that's know? exciting. This stuff, you know, Lenovo's and, and the ThinkPad really have a good reputation. I, yeah. I think they were really great. All right, enough about uh, the Lenovo. That's the Lenovo Yoga... X1 Yoga, second generation, just came out. Let's do, uh, what do you say, a call for help. And on the line right now from Williamsburg, Pennsylvania, hello, Jason. Hello, how are you? I'm great, welcome to the show. Thank you. You're going to Zimbabwe, you lucky guy. Yeah, I am. That's what? fun, are you going on a mission or what are you doing there? I am going on a mission with my church. Fun. Oh, right. How exciting. So, I will be starting the foundation for a new building at the Akufalani Bible Institute. How exciting. Nice. You know, our friend uh, Alex Lindsay went to Zimbabwe for years. He created a school that teaches people how to do video production in Zimbabwe. He loves Zimbabwe. In fact, he even brought me back some Zimbabwe uh, dollars. I think he brought me four or five billion. I can't remember mm. exactly. He said, that might buy you a cup of coffee. <laughs> but it's a we great looking bill. They <laughs> we were told they use American currency at this they, point. They had yeah. to, yeah. Is... Hyperinflation is a terrible yeah. thing. So what can we do to help you in your mm. uh, trip, and your mission? Well, um, I want to take pictures of the work we're going to be doing. I want to take some pictures of landscapes, most likely. And then we're going to be spending the last day and a half or two days at a wild game park. Oh, fun. Uh, so right. a lot of wildlife, which is why I'm asking 
for recommendations in the Zoom area. So I'm um, playing with my budget here and there. I think the email I had sent said uh, under three hundred dollars at this point. I'd like to cap it at four hundred, probably three fifty or less, ideally. And you said Zoom. How much Zoom are you looking for? Um, I actually don't know what's the so wildlife. The you're not going to get right up in the face of a lion. So, yeah, <laughs> ideally, no. Well, You're going to be fairly close to the cars. You know, I mean, these are uh, semi acclimatized to, to human beings. You're so. going to be 100 feet away. So mm -hmm. you so. probably want uh, equivalent of, say, a 200 millimeter lens. You know what we, we should really do? Because I'm not the expert on this. But we happen to have of an course. expert. Kerry Rose is with us. He's the editor at DP Review who was on a little bit earlier. Kerry and I were talking before the show. One thing that came to mind, Kerry, is the rugged. Uh, Pentax, now Ricoh WG cameras, and those, I was surprised to hear you say you liked them. I really love them. Oh, they're fantastic. I mean, uh, they've got the, the Ricoh WG series, Olympus has a TG Tough series, and they're basically the camera for when you don't even want to bring your cell phone out to take photos, right? So these are, will survive anything, possibly, I mean, don't quote me on this, but if, you know, a lion tramps over your over your, your camera, it might still work afterwards. <laughs> yeah, well, but even maybe more to the point, dust and dirt, rain, you can even take them underwater. So, uh, I mm -hmm. mean, now, how's the image quality? I thought it was very good, but you're the pro. Mm. Well, what I, kind of my uh, analogy for this is it's basically, it is going to be a little bit better in your cell phone. I wouldn't expect miracles. Uh, these are still small cameras, and everything you can see on the, on the screen right now, that lens doesn't extend. So everything is very compact in there. It uses a small sensor, kind of like a cell phone sensor. But the trade-off is that you're going to get images that you couldn't get at all with your cell phone, right? So right, an image right. is better than no image. And as you can see, it says on the Ricoh site, 28 mil, uh, 35 millimeter equivalent of 28 millimeters, which is fairly wide, to 140 millimeters, which is range. fairly long. I think would be long enough to do some wildlife photography. Yeah, it should be. And it's I agree. also very rugged, which is what you're going to need out there because uh, you know, the amount of dust and... Right. It's sealed. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's something definitely it's something that's underrated because some of the other, you know, we've got a couple other consumer zooms. There's a Canon uh, SX620 uh, that was around the same price that offers tons more zoom range mm -hmm. um, and similar image quality, but you're, you'll have to be careful with it. So uh, you'll have to kind of weigh that trade off uh, as you're looking at these options. But both of those should be yeah. really good solutions for this trip. The Canon is a PowerShot SX620. Um, and it, these, the nice thing about the power shots, they're very compact. Yeah, they are. But yes. as you say, they're also very, they're a little fragile. This is a 25x zoom. So that's 25 to 625 millimeters equivalent. 600 would be enough to, you know, catch a lion getting mm -hmm. its prey a couple of hundred feet away. Oh, you yes. get a pretty decent shot. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And yeah. they're built fairly solidly as well. I mean, you need, you need to like, get more care of them than you would with the other, but... You know, then they're, they're not no, not pushovers by any manner of and, means. And is that also under uh, four hundred dollars? That is indeed. Yeah, I think uh, I found it listed for about was that two twenty two twenty nine wherever I found it at. Nice. Yeah. I like yeah. the power shots a lot. I think those are really thought, great. And both of those should be honestly, both of those cameras should be available at local stores, like a like a Best Buy or a Target. So you yeah. could go and kind of put your hands on it and see how it feels as well before you uh, make that plunge. Now he's willing to go, as you heard, a little higher than we thought, up to four hundred dollars. Does that change anything? Is there a Fuji uh, or a Lumix or anything that he could get, uh, that maybe a Sony RX, say, well, three that he could get under that? Handle used. Yeah, maybe. Huh? Right. So there's there's two. I have two more options. I know we're going to get into a lot of options here uh, for four fifty, which is a little high, but you can get the previous model uh, for less. It's called a ZS seventy. It's a Panasonic. Lumix ZS70 or the ZS60 is going to be a little cheaper yeah. and then they're going to offer a similar amount of zoom um, to the Canon and also the, at least the newest one they offer really great 4K video clips as well so yeah it's oh, yeah, a little more pricey but yeah. yeah it's not bad we just got the LX10 uh, for our trip as the pocket camera so we'd always have right. something mm. and the 4K video is amazing ah. it's, it's one of the things that Panasonic just excels at hands down is they put 4K in almost every one of their cameras and it's almost always beautiful. And Jason, I know maybe you're thinking a still camera, but I have to say, if you take one, you know, still shots, take a still shot, take a still, every three or four, if you shoot just five seconds of video and audio, you can make, a, that makes a slideshow even more interesting. And it kind of brings that scene back to you in a way. You don't have to shoot a minute, don't shoot a minute. Shoot just five <laughs> or six seconds. Uh, and mix that in. I was taught this by years ago by a very good photographer, and it's really a great technique. Oh, so you get image, image, rawr, and then image. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, seeing that lion move, even for 
a couple of seconds brings the whole scene to life, especially with the audio and the video. So don't don't dismiss the idea of uh, now every camera we've mentioned does does pretty decent video. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you want to probably something that's better than your camera phone because you're going to have a camera phone anyway. Yeah, yeah. that's. And if you, One of the goals. <laughs> yeah. Also, if you've got a high-end smartphone, you probably don't want to be whipping it out in Zimbabwe. I understand it's a, you know, it's a church mission, so people are likely to be much more honest. But if you're just carrying it around, I'd probably take a sort of a slightly cheaper phone and take a better camera because you know it's like getting power is always going to be an issue. It may be an issue in some places as well. Whoa. Okay. Is that with the Lumix? <laughs> wow. Stay oh, away yeah. from the hippos. You know, more people get killed by hippos they, than terrorists. They, they are the number one killers in Africa. It's, uh, a you wouldn't think so. They seem so nice. You want to scratch them behind the ears? Don't. Cranky. They're very cranky. <laughs> yeah, we were warned at our training. That <laughs> yeah. Careful hippos. of the hippos. Careful of the hippos. Well, you're doing something I've always wanted to do. I've, I've always wanted to go on safari in Africa. What fun that will be. Yeah. Jason and I, we've given you four good choices. And we'll put those yes. all in our show Thank notes. You. Yeah, in a, in a pretty broad range, going from two hundred to four hundred fifty dollars. So now it's up to you. Have a great Have trip, a great Jason. Trip. Yeah, and a great Thank mission. Thank you very much. Too. Thank you, I'm Jason. Very jealous. And my sister was born in what's now uh, northern uh, Zambia, and it was no kidding. Yeah, my my dad was out there with the copper mines, and it's uh, always wanted to go. You know, the wildlife. The was he being punished? No, 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 he volunteered. Oh, okay. You know? <laughs> <laughs> all right. So hey, thank you so much for sticking around. We appreciate it. DP Review, Kerry Rose, he's the uh, uh, one of the editors there. The and it is, by the way, I didn't give you a plug last time, but please, <laughs> dpreview.com is the best place before I buy any camera. I always read the reviews on DP Review. You guys know your stuff, and I really appreciate your Definitely. joining us. Thank you. Well, thank you both for having us. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Take care. You too. Uh, let's see. I'm all com discombobulated. Oh, next week we're going to have Nathan uh, Oliveris Giles will be our uh, guest host. Really? I, this is so fun. I get. I like doing the show not only because I miss the screensavers. I love doing the show. I love the conversations we have. But I love getting people like you and Nate on. It's really fun for me ah. to have, have get to work with somebody. I have fun as well. This is one yeah. of the reasons I'm here. Thank you. you know? <laughs> Thank you. If you want to ask a question uh, that Nate can answer, here's how you do it. Need tech help? The new screensavers are here with answers. Email your tech questions to newscreensavers at twit.tv. Love to get your question on the air next week. Mailbag's up next, but first, I'm so excited about this. Nathan brought this by a couple of days ago. I said, that's the coolest uh, toy. This will be, I predict, the toy of 2017. Bigger than spinners? Bigger than <laughs> spinners! <laughs> Watch Nathan's review of the brand new Cars Lightning McQueen from Sphero. This toy car looks like any other you've seen before, but it isn't. It's just as much a device as it is a toy. When you wake it up with a smartphone control app, it comes to life. All right, let's do this. I am ready to be on camera. It's like Lightning McQueen from the Pixar animated series Cars has jumped out of your TV and into your living room. This lightning looks around, talks and moves just like the character from the movies. And when it drives, it even steers and turns like lightning does in the movies too. It makes sense why Sphero, the company that made this robotic RC car, is calling it the ultimate Lightning McQueen. Its rubber tires are friendly to carpet, wood floors, tile and concrete alike. And thankfully, you won't leave tire tracks after doing donuts or drifting. There are, however, a couple things that break the feeling that you're really meeting Lightning McQueen in real life. For one thing, when he talks, he can't talk back to you. Uh, have I mentioned that I love your garage? And the simple smartphone controls, which are a virtual joystick and a couple buttons, aren't as precise as I'd like, especially given the fact that Lightning is a race car. With practice, you'll get a lot better with the wonky controls, but even after a few hours, I still run into plenty of walls and furniture. Thankfully, this two-pound toy is durable enough not to show any major signs of wear during my testing and after handing it over to my colleague Megan Maroney's 12-year-old twin boys. Given its $300 price tag, it better be durable. Let me say that again, $300. You could buy a Nintendo Switch for that price. Sphero says the price is due to the fact that this is the most sophisticated device it's ever made. If you touch the roof, hood, side doors, or trunk, lightning will move in response. He's got an LCD screen for eyes, 
There are more than 450 parts inside, and it can perform more than 150 animations at launch thanks to six different motors and three processors that offer the sort of animatronic polish you'd expect to see on a Disneyland ride. The crowd loves us! And indeed, Disney's Pixar team had a lot of input into the build of this toy. Sphero's similarly convincing BB-8 app-controlled robot was $150, but it was far simpler and smaller. Our kid reviewers, Milo and Huck, had this to say. Yeah, I think the mouth is pretty cool, how the mouth moves and everything. And it's nice and quick. I yeah. would definitely want to buy the BB-8 over this. Like BB-8 and all of Sphero's past products, Ultimate Lightning McQueen is a toy that will get better over time, which helps justify its steep price tag. In the app, there's an acting studio that lets you create a short script he'll act out. While you play a game called Pit Stop Panic, Lightning will critique how you're doing. Hmm, not that one. Thanks to app updates, Lightning is iOS and Android compatible. This toy will get new games and abilities over time. Grab the gas! He can also respond to the first two Cars movies if you're watching them. I make this look way too easy. And eventually, he'll be able to react to the third, which hits theaters on June 16th. Battery life comes in at about 40 minutes, and it can take a couple hours to charge them all the way up. So, is $300 worth it? Well, that's going to come down to how big of a fan you or the... Uh, I'm going to fall asleep if we don't start soon. <laughs> that's going to come down to how big of a fan you or the kids in your life are of Pixar's cars. Unlike most toy cars, this is a toy both adults and kids can enjoy pretty much equally. I'd love to see Sphero bring more characters from Cars to Life and even create an interactive Wally -E robot or some Iron Man toys. Hopefully, as more tech toys come from Sphero and others, the prices will drop too. I'm Nathan Olivares Giles, and you can watch me on the new screensavers on Saturdays and other Twitch shows throughout the week. All right, I'm going to put my Lightroom away here because I was <laughs> messing with that. Thank you, Nathan. Isn't that cool? It's, uh, I can see kids loving it. It's too bad it's 300 bucks. I know, 300 bucks is I a real I think that's almost a show. Price. Yeah. Ms. Firo says they have to charge that much. It's that complicated. It's the most complicated robot they've ever made. But And I'm sure they pay a little bit of money to uh, Disney for licensing Oh, oh yes. So. Never Let's do the man. No, <laughs> just, that can't be that much. <laughs> what? Is there somebody uh, in there? Have I mentioned that I love your garage? What? Oh, lightning oh, is bless. inside. Lightning is ready. So what I, I have to say, there's a lot of personality in this thing. Yeah. I mean, look at the eyes and the and the mouth. Shall we cruise? Yeah, let's cruise. Oh, Go ahead, means Lightning. something else in the UK, actually. but <laughs> I don't know where he's going, but I uh, hope he comes back because uh, I don't want to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> is somebody steering him or is he just doing it on his own? Oh, Jerry's playing with him. Ah. All right. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> He was in. He was in the mailbox. He kept. He kept saying, "I love your garage." He knew he was in the dark. Whoa, lightning! See, three hundred bucks. Still, yeah. I don't know. Here, pick an email. Any email. Okay. There we go. Let's see. Your number. I'm number one. Here we go. From Omar. Hello, Leo and Ian. Says Omar. I'm taking a long vacation. Everybody's going away. Not me. I'm jealous as a <laughs> loud, you know. <laughs> I'm taking a long vacation to Spain, France, Switzerland, and Italy in a couple of weeks. Nice. Seeing, I'm as, the, uh, seeing as I'm the only IT guy for my company, ooh, I'm going to need yeah. daily access to VPN for remote support. First, is there a SIM for my phone that I can purchase before my trip that will give me 4G LTE with a large data allowance? Second, is there a SIM I can use for my mobile hotspot, which is an AT&T Unite Explore? And last, will the SIMs work in all four countries? Thank you, Omar. Well, all four are in the EU. Uh, no, that's the problem. The Switzerland isn't. Oh. Uh, Switzerland is technically outside the EU, but... Because the check. EU has a rule saying that you have to be able to roam within the EU. And yeah, I think that's and they in... cap the charges down. Yeah. So if, if Omar buys a, um, a, a local <sighs> SIM card, the charges are capped. Uh, at a certain level, as long as it's from an EU country to an EU country. Now, as I understand it, Switzerland is part of this mobile capping oh, rate. Good. But you will need to check that because it's the way the Swiss do it, because they're very, very smart this way, is they say, well, the guidelines are there should you want to cap your prices, but they're not going to insist that telcos do. So always check with your provider if you're buying a SIM card locally. But um, 
if you want to remember know. when you do that you're going to if you put a sim in your phone you're going to have a Ready new go, phone yeah. number you're not going to have the same phone number yeah so one solution to that would be maybe to set up something like google voice mm -hmm. to forward your calls from one number to another uh, or have a second phone that is just your regular phone number yeah uh, you can also get, and there are a number of companies that make these cards, like mm -hmm. MiFi cards that use 3G or LTE for data. Many of these are unlimited data for yeah. a fairly affordable price, and then are Wi-Fi access points. That would give your, without losing your phone number, that would give your phone data access, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and 4G LTE in most cases. A and then you wouldn't need this mobile hotspot. Now, you can also go and get something for your mobile hotspot. You already have the uh, AT&T Unite Explorer. So, or I mean, you, uh, you may be in fact able to run a mobile hotspot off a off a standard smartphone. I mean, a number right. of phones can do that. Right. Um, I've, I'm certainly looking at the prices you you're, you're going to be paying. I looked at some. There are some SIM cards like Go SIM and World SIM and the rest of it that you can buy over here, and you're looking at about a hundred dollars per gig when it comes to um, mobile data costs. Uh, generally, with with videos and text thrown in the side, the one I thing got a very affordable uh, uh, device hotspot from uh, Three in the UK. Mm. I think it was thirty pounds for a month of unlimited data. It was a that very was good deal. Really, that's an excellent. Now that was a few years ago, but yeah. I wonder that you know you should shop around. Start soon. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Still, that's... lightning really wants to I'm get. Just it. gonna accidentally. <laughs> <laughs> ah! No! No! Kill him. Uh, but you know there is a website you can go to, prepaid yes. with data. It's a wiki site, so it's prepaidwithdata.wikia.com. But if you just Google prepaid with data, mm -hmm. they have country by country information about who the best carriers are, where you can get SIMs. It's created by users. It's kept up to date. It's a really great resource for people who are traveling. Prepaid with data. Uh, dot com, and that gives you everything you need to know. I would also say that I mean it's increasingly common in Europe and uh, common, relatively common over here as well, but you'll see it a lot more in Europe is cafes, pubs, museums, government buildings having a free Wi-Fi service and don't be afraid to piggyback on that so long as you go into the official service. Just check what the name of the, uh, the correct name of the router is that you've got to connect to. If, you, if it's in a cafe for example, just order a cup of tea or a cup of coffee. Uh, ask them for the password, and nine times out of ten, they'll cheerfully hand it over. That'll really help you save on the, the, you know, the megawatts that you're having to download via cellular. So Wi-Fi is much more common over there than it was. Yeah. Uh, th th this is probably something you can do easily. It's a shame that you have to work on your vacation, mm. but at least you get to travel. So yeah. enjoy. I feel a power nap coming on. He says he feels a power nap coming on. Obviously, <laughs> we're boring Lightning McQueen. Maybe you better get to that second email. Okay, right. This is uh, from Ross. And it's uh, my ESET's uh, NOD32 antivirus license is soon to expire. Oh, good. And I noticed that you no longer promote this product on your show. My operating system is Windows 10, and I want to know, in your honest opinion, should I renew or go to something else? Now, you and I were talking about this earlier. Um, you're of the opinion that basically there's no point in, in an antivirus no. system at the moment. In fact, an antivirus can open you to attacks. Ah, uh, there have been. Which, a, which is a bad thing. Yeah. yeah. So antiviruses, in order to work, often have to hook into the kernel and the operating system at a very low level. Mm -hmm. And we've heard exploits with a number of, I won't name names, but a number of well-known antiviruses that actually, uh, the antivirus allowed the bad guy to attack your system and added a vulnerability. The other problem, of course, is that an antivirus, in most cases, is too slow to catch the problem. These things spread so quickly. Now, with WannaCry, about mm -hmm. one in three antiviruses would have detected it, and yeah. they say blocked it. Uh, but that's one in three. And the problem is, I think an antivirus also gives you a, a false sense of security. The antivirus, in most cases, will not protect you. And so it's better to really be on your toes, be cynical, be watchful, mm -hmm. be careful about what attachments you open, what links you push. And this is the most important thing. Would it protect you against WannaCry? I know you can't do it in all situations, but if you're a home user, keep your system up to date. Not only yes. Windows, but your browsers, anything that goes online, Flash, Shockwave. Any application you have on there has got to be updated. Yeah. And there are a number of checking apps to do this. Uh, Secunia does, does one, and there's a whole bunch of others, but make sure all apps and the operating system are up to date. See, I'm I'm kind of I, I, in two minds about this because 
I've always had security software on the on the on the machine. I find it does give a certain sense of security. Yes, there is the question of laxness. Is it a false it. sense of security? That's the well, real problem, this is it. right? Although the particular uh, AV software I would have stopped WannaCry. Yeah. Uh, Which one uh, are you using? Uh, Malwarebytes. Malwarebytes. Okay. Because uh, I, I I trust their researchers and I like it. And this is in no way an endorsement based on my. We used to yes. recommend Kaspersky, and now there's some question about whether Kaspersky is a is a, a front for the FSB. Yeah, I've so <laughs> I've interviewed Eugene, and you know I the think guy he's is legit. utterly bonkers, but he's yeah. legit. I think he's legit, but he's but again. This is the point. You're giving a third party yeah. access to your system at a very low level. This can be a problem. Remember, the Windows 10 with comes with well. an antivirus. Yeah. It's not the best in the world, but it comes with it. It's Windows Defender. Yeah. It also comes with regular malware checks, malware removal tools. Windows itself, in fact, there's additional tools you can get from Microsoft that you mm -hmm. might want to put on there. I'll tell you, on my new system, there's no antivirus on there. Yeah. I am just extra cautious. I make sure it's up to date, and I'm very careful about where I get software, what links I click, what attach. I never open attachments. And oh. now we know, you, for instance, you have to be uh, careful about uh, Google Docs that ask you for yes. access. I don't think an antivirus would stop that. No. Because an antivirus has to let you do what you want to do. Yeah. It can't, if, if an antivirus were to stop you from doing any of the things that you want to do, like opening attachments, It'd get in your way. But this is so often the problem. It's what we call the layer eight problem in the industry. Because you've got the seven layers of the network stack and then layer eight. The human the layer. human on top that really <laughs> mucks things up layer. badly. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm still a believer in having security software on there. But as you say, Windows 10 comes with a pretty good security suite. Yeah, and I do leave that on. I don't yeah. disable that. And I just, you know, I, I feel like because it comes from Microsoft, it's integrated so well into the operating system, it's not going to be an issue. Yeah, but I mean, just... It, it, it's sensible computing. You don't click on attachments right. from people you don't know. You know, I mean, it's it's rule 101. It's you lock down the system as much as possible. You up, update all your applications in the operating system. These people are going after the low-hanging fruit, and the further up the tree you can get yourself, then the right. safer you're going to be. Basically, you don't want to be a low-hanging fruit. <laughs> I think the words to live by. Hey, there's plenty of monkeys out there. <laughs> and if you are if you are going to use an antivirus, by the way, he said it's fine. I mean, that's of them. Of them all, I think it's one of the best. So if you want an antivirus, you know you need an antivirus, so you just feel like you, you won't be safe with that one, go ahead and renew that ESET. But personally, I don't run an antivirus. Uh, Steve Gibson doesn't run an antivirus. Yeah. Most of the security researchers I know do not use antivirus. Although a lot of the security why. researchers out there use such highly tuned Linux systems that they're never going to get caught in the uh, first yeah, place. Yeah, but they're targets. Remember, yeah. they're targets. They are. Yeah. Well, there we go. That's it. Lightning McQueen and I uh, are going to hit the road. You're just going to have to walk. Yeah, uh, no room for me in there. <laughs> <laughs> we are so glad you were here for uh, the new screensavers. And what a great live studio audience we had. Thank you yeah. all for being here. If you want to be in the studio audience, email tickets at twit.tv. We'll put a chair out for you. We do the show Saturday afternoons, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern, 2200 UTC. And you can also watch live. We have live streams. In fact, the best thing to do is go to twit.tv slash live. Pick Ustream, Twitch, YouTube Live, and you can watch. We even have live audio streams you can listen to. And if you are going to be watching live or listening live, please join us in the chat room. We love having you there at irc.twit.tv. But we know most of you don't watch live because you've got busy, busy lives. And we will make audio and video available for you for free, on demand, for everything we do at our website. In this case, twit.tv slash NSS. Please do download and better yet, subscribe. Find your favorite podcast application and uh, make sure you get it every week. You don't want to miss an episode. This, I, this is one of the shows I love doing more than any other. Partly it's good of fun. People like it's you, It's a Ian, lot of fun. But also because of the great variety of subject matter. I, I like the covered. questions, to be honest. I mean, it's just like the chance too. to actually help on that is really quite yeah, fun. Yeah, it's really fun. So please come back. We'll see you next time on the new screensavers. Bye-bye. Yay! Memorial Day weekend! Yay!